Hey everyone, uh, welcome back. We're obviously about to get started with our new school year. So uh, hope you guys all had a fantastic summer. And um, things are looking pretty different now, of course, um, since you know COVID-19 sort of messed up the end of last school year. Um, but one of the other changes is obviously that I am now teaching a couple more of your classes. So last year it was just math, and this year it's going to be math science and geography. So um, in this lesson, we are going to be starting uh, just a little bit of an intro to um, to geography, uh, an intro to the kinds of things that I would like to cover in this course, the things that I hope you guys will sort of start to think about. Um, I'm going to go through all of the things that I'm hoping to get through with you guys and um, Ideally, I think even if I don't get through all of it with you guys, I'll see if I can still find the time to just churn out the rest of the videos, even if they're not things that you guys will be tested on, um, just so you can watch it on your own time, or maybe somebody else can watch it on their own time uh, on YouTube, or maybe so that uh, your teachers could use this in a future year when they have a little bit more time to um, to give to these geography classes. So. Um, Without wasting any time, let's get started. So uh, the first thing is I just want to go over the different topics that I'm hoping to cover with you guys. Um, and in light of the different classes that I'm going to be teaching, I figured making the lessons on PowerPoint would be a little bit easier um, than using the whiteboard, just because for things in geography, if we're working with maps or or flags or something later on, um, it'll be a lot easier to have the actual pictures that I want on the screen rather than me trying to draw everything and, and wasting your time while I'm drawing that stuff. So um, yeah, so we're going to be doing all of these lessons through PowerPoint and some of the things I want to cover, as you can see on the screen here, are the five major topics that are, are listed there. So the first one is the structure and the characteristics of Earth. So that's like the internal structure of the planet from the core all the way out to the crust. We're going to talk about the differences between each of those regions. Um, we'll talk about characteristics of the Earth's landscape. Uh, in, the, in that second point, we'll talk about what shapes the landscape, what processes are at play that create the features that we see on the landscape. And then we'll move on to talking about Earth's climate, the way it is right now, the way it's changed in recent years, thanks to the greenhouse effect and things like that. Um, we'll talk about what else might be influ influencing the climate that we don't really have control over. Um, and that'll sort of hit the main point. So I'm going to get back to all of these in a little bit more detail in a second. Uh, after that, we'll talk about political geography, um, which might sound like a bit of an alien concept if you haven't really heard the term used before. But basically, if you've ever looked at a map that has uh, all of the countries of the world on it, um, that's a that's a political map. Um, if you see one that's um, like a map of the of the United States and you see all of the, the individual states uh, shown in different colors, that's another example. Um, so it's not like uh, it's some foreign strange thing that nobody's ever seen before. It's just a term that maybe not a lot of people would use to describe uh, what they see in those maps. So we'll discuss political geography, we'll explore different uh, countries, languages, customs that are sort of uh, common to a given region, uh, and then we'll sort of go like continent by continent through the world and, uh, and try and get a better understanding of that. And then we'll move on to studying uh, a little bit of flags, so like rules of flag design, common themes that you'd see in national flags, and maybe if we have more time provincial or state flags. Um, we'll talk about uh, an, another common theme, which would be certain colors being used in certain regions. So for example, um, the Pan-African colors or the Pan-Arab colors. Um, and we'll get all to that. Uh, we'll get to all of that later on in the year. And then we'll finish off with maps. I'm hoping that we have enough time for all of it because um, maps I find to be really fascinating and I took a course on maps uh, this past summer so I'm hoping to be able to 
teach you guys some of what I learned in that course. So let's go ahead and break down each of these subjects uh, one at a time. So the first unit that we're going to cover, I know there were only five bullet points on the previous page, but the sixth sort of invisible point, which should have been at the beginning, is just an introduction to geography in general, what it is, why we study it, how it's changed over time. We're only going to spend two or three classes on it. Um, there are a couple of cool YouTube channels that I follow um, that have some nice information about geography that is different from the kind of stuff I learned in school. So I'm going to see if I can also make enough time for a class to just go through a couple of those channels, tell you what they're about, tell you the kinds of videos that you'll find on there. And then if you want, you could go and explore those on your own time. Uh, in terms of projects and testing and homework and all of that stuff, there would not really be anything that comes out of those YouTube channels. Um, it's more of just for you guys to learn more. And if there is something that I want you guys to watch a video and then write something about it or take something away from it, then I would make that really clear about that video in particular, not in this uh, additional resources lecture that we're going to get to uh, in a couple of classes. So this first unit is basically just an intro to why geography is important, what exactly it means. Um, it's not just memorizing place names and rivers and the tallest mountains and the deepest valleys. It's, it's a lot more than that. It's a lot more involved than that. Um, so we're going to talk about why it's important and then we'll move on into the different areas that I was discussing before. So let's get into those now. So our second main unit is going to be um, focusing on the structure and the characteristics of Earth, uh, both inside the planet and on its surface. So um, as you can see in the little picture in the corner there, um, we will spend a bit of time looking at the internal structure of the planet. So you can see the, the different layers there with different colors uh, in, that, uh, in that picture. Uh, and so we'll explore what each of those different layers are, and uh, maybe we can even break them down into even smaller categories. But um, if we're keeping it simple, we'll just talk about the sort of the four big uh, areas that need to be discussed. Um, we'll go through all of those. We'll explain what uh, what is different between them, what's important uh, in ways that we might not expect. Um, for example, one of these layers is responsible for generating the planet's magnetic field, uh, which protects us from a lot of stuff that comes that uh, comes our way from the sun. So we'll get into all of that when we're in this unit discussing the structure of the planet. Um, then we'll move on to the characteristics of the Earth's surface, and that's a little bit of the looking at rivers, valleys, mountains, things like that. What's the highest peak? Why is it the highest peak? Um, what kinds of things uh, are responsible for um, for erosion. We'll explore all of those in, in sort of little bits and pieces here, and then we'll get into that uh, a little bit more, I believe, in the next, uh, maybe in the next unit. Uh, or no, not in the next unit. That's going to be in science. We're going to study weathering and erosion um, more closely in our geology unit in science. But uh, here we'll talk a little bit about it, and then we'll get into more detail in our science videos. Uh, and then we'll end off unit two with looking at the atmosphere, uh, the composition of the atmosphere, different clouds, how those types of clouds form, and uh, what those kinds of clouds uh, can mean. There are ways that you can you can look at a, a cloud in the sky and be fairly confident of the type of weather that's coming your way. If it'll be good weather, bad weather, cold, warm, storms. There's some information that you can gather just by looking at the clouds um, on the horizon. So we'll get into a little bit of that as well in this unit. So, oh, okay, so I was wrong. So in this, uh, it is in this next uh, unit. I think we might also talk about it in science. We'll talk a, l uh, a little bit about it there. But we are going to focus on weathering and erosion here as well. Um, it's a pretty important uh, a pair of processes, weathering and erosion, that shapes the features that we see uh, on the planet uh, on the planet's surface today. Um, and we will uh, explore how rivers 
and how glaciers uh, especially affect those uh, uh, the, the the landscape that we see. So obviously glaciers for for you guys it's not such a big deal being uh, on a tropical island, but for me here in Canada, um, I know that in my city there are there's still evidence of uh, glaciers having been here a few thousand years ago. So it is important in some really, really large areas of North America and Europe uh, and Asia as well. Um, and uh, of course, glaciers are still uh, present in, in the polar regions today. So in Greenland and in Antarctica, you can find uh, glacial ice sheets. And those are really important when we are considering things like climate change and sea level rise. Uh, so we'll get into all of that as well. Uh, and what I sort of glossed over is uh, that at the beginning of this unit, we'll also have a brief, brief discussion on plate tectonics, which leads to earthquakes and volcanoes um, uh, all around the planet. Uh, and we'll talk about why those earthquakes happen where they do, why those volcanoes form where they do. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about it here, but this is the topic that we'll cover uh, more thoroughly in our science class. So we'll focus a little bit on it here. We'll just give a little bit of an intro to it before we move on to weathering and erosion. Um, just because it is important when we're considering um, when we're considering how the planet's landscape is changed, earthquakes and volcanoes do play a big role in that. So we need to talk about them uh, and we need to talk about why they are where they are. Um, but yeah, most of the time uh, that we spend on plate tectonics will be in our science class, so stay tuned for that as well. Okay, then once we've finished uh, talking about the planet's landscape, we'll move on to talking about the planet's climate. Um, so this means we'll discuss the different reasons that contribute to the seasons that we see. Now, obviously, we don't see very pronounced seasons in the tropics. You won't find very pronounced differences in the seasons in northern Brazil, in the Dominican Republic, in Mexico, in Egypt. You don't see huge changes um, between summer and winter. But in places like Canada or Russia or even the UK, you'll see some clear differences uh, between hot and cold. In other countries, in other areas, you'll see differences in terms of wet and dry seasons instead of a change in temperature. Um, and so that's uh, something that we'll get into as well. Um, we'll discuss the characteristics of Earth's orbit because some of that has to do with changes in seasonal cycles like over a, a longer period of time. Uh, and uh, the way the Earth's orbit changes, the way the Earth's axis changes, uh, all have an effect on um, on the way that the climate changes on the planet and what we would experience. It's not something that you would really notice a change in over the course of a human lifetime. All of the changes that we're seeing here are happening on, uh, are, are happening as a result of different reasons, some of which are human caused, many of which are human caused, and then some of which that are probably just the, the way the, the planet was naturally going to go anyway. Um, but we'll get into that and we'll also explore how humans are affecting the, the planet's climate, like when we're talking about the greenhouse effect. Um, so it's going to be uh, uh, a, an interesting unit to explore how the climate is supposed to be based on our historical data. And then we'll see just how much humans have changed it just in the last one or 200 years. Um, I found it really interesting when I was studying this, and I hope you guys find that interesting as well. Uh, we'll also discuss atmospheric and oceanic currents, so the way that energy is distributed between the equatorial regions of the planet, close to the equator, and the polar regions, close to the North and South Pole. Um, and we'll explore how uh, that energy is transported and why it's important to, for example, uh, countries in Northern Europe rely on warm water coming from Mexico, coming from the Gulf of Mexico. So we'll get into all of that in this unit as well. And then lastly, we'll discuss continental and maritime climates, which is um, really, really fascinating. And it's something that we're actually going to have uh, a project on is you're going to examine uh, a whole bunch of different cities uh, around the planet. You're going to look at their climate data, and then we're going to 
uh, I say we, you guys are going to do this individually and make a presentation on it. Uh, you're going to decide whether a given city is continental or maritime just based on its climate data. Um, but I'm going to get into that in a little bit more detail a little bit later on. Next up is political geography. So uh, this is what I was talking about at the beginning with, uh, if you've ever looked at a map that has all of the countries on it, uh, that would be political geography. So uh, in this, we'll be looking at different countries around the planet. We'll be looking at different themes uh, that are common in certain regions, such as certain languages or religions or different different customs, different uh, flag design, that kind of stuff that we'll, we'll look at, uh, you know, a, one continent at a time and we'll examine what's similar between all of these countries. How does it change from this continent to the one beside it? We'll look at all that stuff in this unit. Uh, we might, if we have time, uh, look at endonyms and exonyms, which is just different ways of naming a region. Endonyms are uh, names that a region gives to itself. So the inhabitants of a region give themselves a name. That name is an endonym. And if someone else gives them a name, that's an exonym. So uh, we'll get into that as well. And we'll explore some endonyms and exonyms around the world. And then we'll get into vexillology, which is the study of flags. So we'll look at how flags are used, how flags are designed, the names of the different parts of a flag, the different sides of the flag. Um, we'll look at all of that. There are some principles of how to design a good flag, and we'll look at that as well. Uh, and we'll look at some common themes seen in different flags around the world. Uh, I'm going to see if I can use the pen to sort of highlight a couple of ideas here. Um, so if you look at this little picture, I, maybe I should have made it bigger if I was going to draw on it, but in some parts of Africa and the Middle East, you'll see that there's a lot of green, white, red, and black in those regions. And then in large sections of Africa, in large sections of sort of the rest of Africa, you'll see there's a lot of red, yellow, green, and black. Obviously, it's not everywhere. You don't see it everywhere throughout the continent. Uh, there are some countries that don't seem to follow uh, those um, those uh, so sort of patterns that you see in their neighboring countries. Um, we'll talk about things like what each color means um, for certain flags. Certain flags will use red to symbolize, uh, you know, bloodshed in, in a war for independence. Some of them will use it uh, as a symbol of a revolution things like that. So we'll get into all of that when we're studying flags and how flags are designed. And we're going to take part of that information from this unit and combine it with the next unit to build our second project. So before I get into the project, let's discuss that last unit, which is maps. And so um, the fancy word for the study of maps is cartography. So we're going to begin this unit by looking at the history of cartography, the reason why uh, it's important to society that we that we try to accurately represent the the planet uh, on paper, the planet surface on on paper on a map. Uh, we'll look at different map projections, which is basically different ways to draw the map depending on how you want it to look and what message you're trying to communicate. Um, we'll look at different types of maps, so uh, how different color schemes are used in different situations, uses of maps. Sometimes maps are used purely as an information, as like a general information system for anybody to look at it and get a little bit of knowledge about a, about a given place. Sometimes it's about roadmaps. Sometimes it's about, you know, uh, political affiliations. You'll often see, you know, after a U.S. election, you'll see all of the states colored red or blue, depending on who um, it's uh, its civilians voted for in the election. So that's also a, a different type of map. Uh, that we can get into. We'll also explore time zones and topographic maps. Topographic maps are the ones that show differences in elevation and time zones I'm including in this unit just because it kind of makes sense in the context of a maps unit and uh, I didn't really write it on here but we'll also at some point get into um, studying latitude and longitude because that's really important when it comes to flag design. I just haven't explicitly written it out here as uh, as a lesson, it'll sort of be a, a subsection of a different lesson. 
So there were a couple of projects that I uh, alluded to at the beginning of this lesson, and uh, one of them is uh, about continental and maritime climates. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to explore the climate data for a bunch of different cities around the world. It's not hard to find the climate data. If you go to the Wikipedia uh, page for a whole bunch of different cities, um, you'll find that lots and lots and lots of them have climate data uh, for things like highest and lowest temperature in a given month for every month of the year, precipitation throughout the year, snowfall, if that applies, they'll put a specific row just for talking about snowfall. They'll put things like how much sunlight uh, a given region gets or a given city gets over the course of the year. So it has lots and lots of information for lots and lots of different cities. Um, but to keep it simple for you guys, uh, when it comes time for this project, I will give you a list of cities that I know have their climate data right on Wikipedia so that you can take it right from there uh, and, you know, uh, get your results from that. So uh, just to outline it now, this isn't something you have to get started on right now. I'll make another video when we're really starting this project. Um, but uh, basically the way it's going to work is you're going to choose a bunch of different cities from my list and make sure that you have at least a couple of cities that fit all of those categories that are on the screen. Some cities that are near the coast, some cities that are way deep inside the continent, northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, tropical regions close to the equator. Try and get at least a couple of cities from all of those areas so that we can look at how the climate graph, the climate data shifts uh, between cities in different regions. Um, we're going to get into more of how you can represent that climate data uh, when we're discussing it in uh, in the the appropriate unit where we're discussing the, the planet's climate. Um, but for now, this is just a little bit of an intro. Uh, and to show you what I mean, I believe I got a couple of screenshots. Um, oh, I'll get to the screenshots in a second. Um, but yeah, so this is just what I was saying uh, a second ago. Um, uh, you're going to end up making some sort of presentation. It can be on the computer if you want, uh, or maybe it'll have to be on the computer, depending on uh, how this COVID stuff goes by the time we get to this project. Um, we'll discuss, uh, I'm going to ask each of you to discuss the similarities and differences between the climate patterns for different cities, whether they were close to the coast, whether they were deep inside the continent, things like that. Um, and yeah, just to discuss what uh, what surprised you and whether it was similar to what you expected or whether your results were different from what you expected. So now here uh, here's an example of the uh, climate data that you could find on Wikipedia. This is the climate data for Berlin, Germany. So uh, if you have looked at a map of Germany, you'll see that it's not really that far from a body of water. Um, I mean, Germany is quite small and is really close to the to the uh, water just north of it. So um, you can uh, look at this data and you can you can get some information from it to, and you can see things like um, does the temperature stay relatively constant throughout the year? Does it change a lot? between seasons. Is it warmer in January or is it warmer in July? That'll tell you which hemisphere it's in, northern hemisphere or southern hemisphere. You can see closer to the bottom, uh, let me see if I can highlight that, you can see right uh, here in this row, you can see, uh, that's a terrible arrow, but you know, we're going to make it work. Um, in this row, you can see uh, precipitation. Uh, down here, you can see um, sun sunlight hours. Uh, this arrow is terrible, but yeah, you can see the hours of sunshine that uh, that Berlin normally gets for each month uh, of the year. Um, so there's lots of information here, and I'm, I've got a few other examples so that you can see how this changes from uh, from one city to the next in different places. So we've just discussed Berlin, uh, and you can see this graph, and you can always go back to this and pause and look at it, or just go on Wikipedia and look it up yourself. Um, Let's look at a couple of other examples. So here's the climate data for Tripoli, which is the capital of Libya. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot more red and orange on this one, which suggests it's probably a lot hotter. Um, it still changes a lot between January and July, which once we get to our climate unit, you'll understand why that is. Um, down below, down here, 
right about here, you can see what I mean with um, uh, slightly more rainy seasons and more uh, dry seasons. It's, it's hot year round, but the precipitation, the amount of precipitation also changes a lot. You can see right here in, uh, in August, there's an average of, of less than, uh, of basically no rain. Is, is what you can see. There's 0.1 millimeters of rain, which in imperial units is basically zero inches of rain uh, for the entire month of August on average for decades at a time. So uh, this is the kind of information that you can get from a climate graph and we'll explore a lot more of what this means uh, when we get to our climate unit. Just for a bit of a change, here's another example of, uh, of a climate graph. This is for the city of Trondheim in Norway, which uh, I've picked just because it's it's colder than Tripoli. So you can sort of see how it changes here. There's a lot less red and orange. There's still a little bit because the summer months uh, are still reasonably warm. Um, but you can see that the the deeper blue down here, the, these these shades of blue we weren't really seeing before. Um, because it does get quite, quite cold uh, in Trondheim in the winter. So um, those are the kinds of things that you will, uh, you'll pick up on when we're doing this uh, project. You'll be able to tell a lot of information from this climate graph, whether the city is really close to the poles, is it close to water, is it far away from water, is it in the northern hemisphere, is it in the southern hemisphere, is it more equatorial. We'll figure all of that out when we get into our climate unit. And last one, just for fun, this is an, uh, a Russian research station in Antarctica. And this is the research station that has actually recorded the lowest temperature uh, that has ever been recorded, which is minus 89.2 degrees Celsius or minus 127 degrees Fahrenheit almost. Um, so, uh, or, sorry, no, I was looking at the wrong column. It's minus 128.6 degrees Fahrenheit, I was looking at the column beside it, which is 126.9. Um, but yeah, so uh, this is just another example. You Here you can see the really, really deep blues are showing really, really cold temperatures. You can see how the sunlight uh, changes and how, because it's in the polar regions, there are a few months of the year where there's just no sun whatsoever. So these are the kinds of things we'll explore in that project. More details are going to come for this you know, um, in a in many many weeks time, maybe a few months time when we start this project. Um, but I just wanted to give you an idea of just I just picked four places at random, and all of them had climate data um, right on Wikipedia. Trondheim I don't think is a particularly huge city, um, or at least not a particularly famous city as far as I know. Um, so it uh, it shows you that you can find climate data even for cities that you might never have heard of before. Um, so yeah, that's just a, a few examples of those climate graphs. And then when we get to this project, I'll show you some more of these and you'll have a better idea of what the data on these graphs uh, actually mean. The second project that we get to later on, once again, I'm just gonna give you a sort of a, a quick rundown uh, here. And that's, uh, you're gonna create your own fictitious island. You're gonna create an island from scratch you're going to describe its location on the Earth's surface using latitude and longitude, which we'll discuss um, uh, when we're when we're talking about maps. You're going to add different features to uh, the island. I'm going to get into more details of what you have to add and how much you have to add and stuff like that. Um, it's it might be an optional thing to add uh, the, uh, a flag for your country. So you can build a flag using the principles of flag design that we're going to talk about using the color schemes that we're going to talk about, take into consideration what each color normally means for a flag. So sometimes, you know, they'll use blue or white to symbolize a peace or a unity or a body of water. Or so, you know, they'll have different reasons to use different colors, red for bloodshed or for liberty or for, you know, they'll, they'll use it for a whole bunch of different reasons. Um, so we'll look at uh, all of those things in our flags and maps. Uh, areas of this course, and then you can use that information to to build your own uh, island. We'll talk about the things that you need to make sure you include on your map uh, in order for it to be a good map. So things like a legend and an arrow pointing north, things like that. 
uh, and then you'll make a presentation of it um, to the class and you'll explain the different choices that you made, like uh, the colors for your flag. Why did you choose the colors that you chose? And you'll be expected to take that information out of things that we've talked about in the class, you know, putting cities close to rivers because humans depend on uh, on a steady supply of water, things like that. We'll get into all of that a lot later. I just wanted to give you guys an intro of what you're kind of looking at. So if you want to start brainstorming a couple of months in advance, you have the information uh, readily available. So I would like to just round off this lesson by uh, giving you something to think about. I took a geography course this summer and uh, the the first sort of chapter was just trying to get the students to internalize this idea that everything is connected. You know, when you're living on the earth, just looking at, you know, neighborhood to neighborhood or country to country, it can be difficult to see how everything is connected, especially when you look at political problems in the world. We just see a whole bunch of people against each other. Everything is everything is uh, not really in harmony the way we would like it to be. But then even just looking at, if you look beyond political problems and the problems that people face, if you just look at the climate, it can be really difficult to understand how air pollution is related to uh, health of forests and how deforestation is affecting the climate and how the ozone layer is affecting different things. So the thing I want you to try and internalize is that everything on the earth is connected. And maybe a good way to sort of understand that is to just zoom out a little bit, because if you're sitting in one house, in one city, in one country, it can seem like other cities or other countries or other people are really far away and really disconnected and other parts of the world like the Antarctic or the Arctic or the deserts of Africa and Asia are all really far away and not really connected to what you might be doing. So let's take a step back and uh, look at an image that might not look completely familiar at first, but you'll see what I mean. So if we just take a step back, we zoom out. This picture is, of course, uh, of Earth. And um, it might look a little bit weird because this isn't quite uh, the way most of us s sort of remember seeing this picture. And the reason I've uh, shown this image is that you can see, maybe, uh, hopefully you can tell, that right here, this is the southern part of Africa, but upside down, right? And then over here is you know, Saudi Arabia and the rest of the Middle East. Right over here is Madagascar. Um, and, you know, here's here's where Africa co continues. So it's a little bit weird to see it from this angle. But the reason I'm showing it like this is because the picture that got publicized is this one. This one right here. This is the image that got publicized uh, that most of the world... Um, is now uh, familiar with. Uh, and this is the famous blue marble picture. And you can see that one of the things they did to this picture, aside from touching up the colors and stuff, is that they rotated it so that north was up on this globe. And that's something that cartographers and historians have, uh, have been sort of studying and seeing if there's a, a reason why everybody seems to associate north with being up it was just a random convention that was decided hundreds of years ago, but we still are so unfamiliar with an upside down map or an upside down globe that they had to flip this picture over before um, before it was uh, made public and, and before, you know, really got famous. So uh, those are the kinds of things that we'll also study in our maps units, how uh, maps can be used to mislead or how to uh, misrepresent information. If there's a, a reason why we look at maps the way we do, if there's a reason why upside down maps look strange to us, things like that are things that we need to think about. But uh, the thing I'm trying to, the idea, the main idea I'm trying to get across with this picture of the planet is that when you're looking at the whole planet in, in one image, it, it's a lot easier to understand that things are connected on the surface, that things that happen maybe up here in Africa, it's not that uh, unlikely that they're connected to things that happen down here. It might not be 
as direct a connection as we would like it to be, but on the surface of the planet, you can see it's not outlandish to think that things that happen here are connected to things that happen down there. We could zoom out even further. This right here, where, where you see the arrow, is pointing to Earth as seen from Saturn. And uh, it's a lot easier when you're looking at an image like this to tell that uh, everything on the surface is connected. You know, if things in, uh, in Africa and Antarctica basically show up as pretty much the same dot, on on this uh, on this tiny tiny earth then it's easier to understand that the things that happen in one location will affect things that happen in a different location and of course just one more this is a really really zoomed out view of earth this is taken by the voyager space probe from i believe it was about four billion miles away um and you can see that there's there's no distinction between, you know, any of the Earth's features. You can't tell. You can't tell very much about the Earth at all. Um, but from a view like this, it's really easy to see uh, that everything that happens on the planet is connected to everything else on the planet. Everything that's going on that we see in the world is all happening in that little space, and uh, it's it's not that outlandish to understand that. Uh, that things that happen on one side of this little dust grain affect things that happen on the other side of that little dust grain. So that's the idea that I want to leave you with for this introductory lesson is that everything is connected. We're going to be talking about a whole bunch of different things in this course. We'll be talking about maps and flags. We'll be talking about rivers and glaciers. We'll be talking about landscape features, the center of the planet, the magnetic field. We'll be talking about lots and lots of different things, cloud formation, and, you know, we're, we're going to get into so many different topics, but one thing I want you guys to try to remember is that all of these different ideas and all of these different topics are connected. All right, that's it for this lesson. I will see you guys in the next one. Have a good one.